Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. It's uh, with, with a great deal of pleasure uh, that I get to introduce Sharon Goldwater, who's uh, uh, currently at the Department of Linguistics at Stanford University and uh, she's going to be talking to us about uh, non-parametric Bayesian uh, language learning and uh, um, yeah I think I'll just let her take it from there. Thanks a lot. Um, so this is some joint work uh, that I did uh, as part of my thesis uh, at Brown University with uh, Mark who was in fact my advisor there um, as well as uh, with Tom Griffiths. Um, so the problem that I'm actually primarily interested in is unsupervised learning uh, and unsupervised learning of language, um, which uh, I think is an important research problem for a number of reasons. Um, one of the most commonly given reasons for this is that um, if we start working on a new language um, where perhaps we don't have a lot of resources, um, then being able to do unsupervised learning could actually help us to develop systems rapidly for that language. Um, I think there's actually a couple of other reasons. Um, even in languages where we do have resources, if we're actually trying to do some kind of new problem for which we don't have annotated data, um, these kinds of tools might be useful. Um, and also, uh, for my own uh, research, I'm actually also interested in the problem of human learning. Uh, and so I think that uh, looking at the um, kinds of ways that we might be able to get unsupervised learning to work in computers may also shed some light on human cognition as well. Um, so basically my research uh, focuses on um, trying to look at the question of whether there are some kind of general principles or tools that we might be able to use um, both to gain insight into the problem of unsupervised learning um, as well as potentially to improve performance on actual tasks. Um, so today I'm going to be arguing that um, approaching this problem using a non-parametric uh, Bayesian framework uh, is a, a good way um, to, to proceed. So before I get into that, I just want to go quickly over what I mean by a non-parametric Bayesian framework. Um, so kind of the most basic uh, aspect of Bayesian modeling is that our models are going to include some kind of prior distribution over the hypothesis space. Um, and, uh, but there's actually sort of an additional component which um, I talked about a little bit more in my uh, ACL presentation I won't be focusing on today. Um, but another aspect of Bayesian modeling that is included in these models that I'll be talking about um, is the fact that future predictions um, are actually based on uh, integrating out the parameters. So we're going to base them on a weighted average of possible parameter values uh, rather than choosing uh, a particular set of parameter values um, and, and basing our predictions on those. Um, so that's sort of what I mean by Bayesian. Uh, what do I mean by non-parametric? Well, basically what I mean is that uh, we don't actually have to specify the model size in advance. Um, so as our data size grows, the size of the model itself is also going to grow. Um, and I'll try and explain a little bit about why that might be useful. So here's the outline of my talk. Uh, I'm going to start off by trying to explain why I think non-parametric Bayes is a good way to go, uh, using a motivating example of word segmentation. Uh, then I'll be going over a sort of general framework that we've been working on for Bayesian models of language um, and showing how that relates to um, other kinds of standard models. Uh, I'll then go back to the problem of word segmentation and show how we can apply this uh, modeling framework uh, to that problem, uh, developing a couple of different models, a Dirichlet process model and a hierarchical Dirichlet process model. Um, and then finally I'll be talking about uh, another application to learning morphology where you, we used a model called the pittman dior model. Uh, and then I'll conclude. Okay, so uh, just starting off with sort of the basic approach that we're taking here. Um, obviously there's a lot of approaches that we could take to unsupervised learning. Um, I think that uh, taking a model-based approach has a number of advantages. Um, first of all, uh, because of the kinds of questions that I'm interested in, uh, I think taking this sort of approach can allow us to examine the assumptions that are helpful for learning and the kinds of constraints that we need to impose on our learning system uh, independent of the algorithmic implementation. Um, I also think that uh, once we do this, if we're using uh, models and we design them well, we can actually often uh, use general purpose kinds of learning algorithms um, with well-known properties of convergence uh, and, and so forth um, and don't need to uh, worry about that as much. Um, and the final advantage here is that uh, in, in theory we can actually layer components together in a very nice mathematical way um, to potentially create larger systems 
um, to learn more complicated kinds of information. When you say model-based? Yes, probabilistic model. It's, it's based on a probabilistic model as opposed to, for example, doing some kind of dimensionality reduction based on you know, vectors or, uh, or a heuristic uh, procedure or something like that. Yeah. Yes, right. Um, so all of the models I'm going to be talking about are generative models. Um, and yeah, I'm not going to, I mean, we've had arguments about generative dis discriminative. I'm not going to talk about that today. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> probabilistic model, yes. That's why I didn't use the word generative or discriminative. <laughs> yes, sorry, OK. Probabilistic model based, OK. Um, so maybe this will clarify, actually. So here's kind of the standard model-based approach, okay? So we start off by defining a model. Uh, so our model uh, contains a number of variables. Uh, some of those may be observed variables, the x's. Some of those are uh, unobserved variables, the z's. And we have some parameter theta, per set of parameters, theta. Um, and then we're going to use some kind of uh, estimation procedure, usually maximum likelihood. It might be uh, maximum a posteriori. Um, we're going to estimate the best set of parameters for our model. Um, the problem with this is some, uh, that arises often is that if we're trying to compare models that have different uh, kinds of structures or different numbers of parameters or something like that, um, then we actually need to use some kind of model selection. Um, because in general, if we have more parameters, then maximum likelihood will choose that model, uh, uh, even though that's not necessarily justified. Um, so we can do model selection. Uh, with the way that we might do that is by estimating the best theta for a variety of different model complexities. Um, and then use something like maybe held out data or a likelihood ratio test to choose between those uh, different models. Um, so this works in some cases. Uh, the problem is it's not even always possible to do that. So sometimes we can't actually explicitly examine all the different possible models that we might want to do. Um, so here's an example uh, of how this might run into trouble. So let's say we're doing word segmentation. Um, so we're given a corpus of uh, fluent speech or text. So in this case, uh, it's just a bunch of utterances where we know the boundaries of the utterances, but we don't know word boundaries within the utterances. Um, and we want to identify the words. So this is a problem that comes up as preprocessing in Asian languages. Um, and it may also, and, and also it's an important uh, language acquisition task in humans um, from speech. So let's try and do maximum likelihood word segmentation. Okay. So this actually has been proposed um, in 2001 by um, ben Kataraman, he uh, proposed using just a standard n-gram model for this task uh, with maximum likelihood estimation. Um, so the hypothesis space here uh, consists of all the different possible segmentations of the input corpus, uh, along with probabilities for each word type uh, in, the cor uh, the, uh, in the segmentation. Um, so the problem is that uh, if we do this and we don't constrain the size of the model, then the maximum likelihood solution is actually going to be a trivial solution. Uh, so the reason is that each utterance is just going to be memorized as a single word uh, with probability equal to its empirical probability. Uh, and it's pretty easy to see that, that actually um, this is the highest probability solution um, because as soon as we start adding boundaries into any of those utterances, um, we have to shift some probability mass onto unseen utterances because as soon as we hypothesize that boundaries are possible, uh, we can start stringing together uh, different words in different ways and make new utterances that didn't uh, exist in our training corpus. Um, and so that means that, in fact, the probability uh, under that solution of the, of the observed utterances must be lower. Um, so this maximum likelihood solution is, is trivial. Um, we could think about maybe trying to do this by explicitly um, computing all the different ways that we could sequence the data into, you know, into, sorry, segment the data into different numbers of words and then compare all of those different solutions uh, using, you know, as I said, held out things or likelihood ratio or something like that. But it, it just doesn't seem like it's feasible to do that um, because there's so many different ways that we could segment the data. Um, so what this suggests is that, uh, you know, obviously this is not what Venkataraman did. Um, but of course he didn't come up with this trivial solution because he was able to publish something, right? So he must have come up with something reasonable. Um, but of course the reason for that, uh, you know, by this argument is not uh, because of his model, but in fact because of in implicit constraints that were imposed um, by the search procedure. Um, and so I've kind of been arguing about uh, that we want to use a model-based approach so that we can examine the kinds of assumptions that are in the model. Uh, it's hard to, to look at that if we're also being uh, constrained by the search procedure. Um, and so I would argue that this really doesn't make a lot of sense for the kind of uh, research program that I'm talking about. So here's a possible solution to this problem. 
Um, Michael Brent in 1999 uh, defined a Bayesian model for word segmentation. Uh, so this model uh, actually includes a prior that is going to favor solutions that have fewer uh, words in them and shorter lexical items. Um, so that's going to actually prefer solutions that uh, contain some boundaries. Uh, he then used an approximate online algorithm um, that he kind of designed specifically for this task uh, in order to su search for the map solution. Um, so this is kind of a good start to this problem, um, but there's actually a number of issues with it. First of all, it turns out it's actually kind of hard to modify or extend his model in any interesting way. Um, and, uh, well, that's actually what I want to do in my research here. So, uh, you know, modifying models, I think, is, is the... Uh, something that we need to do, so we'd like to have a model that, uh, uh, that we can actually modify. Um, and secondly, uh, it turns out, and I'll show results uh, indicating this a little bit later, that Michael Brent's results were actually influenced by the special purpose search algorithm that he used. Okay, so can we do better than this? Um, we'd like to actually be able to develop models that uh, allow comparison between solutions of varying complexity um, without having to explicitly enumerate them all. Um, that also are able to use standard search algorithms uh, and, as I said, that can be modified to explore the effects of different kinds of assumptions in those models. Um, and in particular, the different kinds of assumptions that we might want to look at um, are, include things like properties of lexical items. So we might want to say something about what a typical word might look like. Uh, and we also want to say something about properties of word behavior. So how often is a word likely to appear? Um, other kinds of questions are, you know, is context, you know, does the context in which a word appears um, affect, uh, you know, how, how does that affect the probability of that word? Um, so it turns out that, of course, as you might guess from my title, using techniques from non-parametric Bayesian statistics, uh, we can develop models that uh, do all of these things. Um, and in particular, uh, we've developed a framework, which I'm calling the two-stage modeling framework, uh, in which we actually separate the work of language modeling into two different steps. Uh, that actually allow us to model these two properties that I talked about. So in the first step of these models, we assume that we're going to have some distribution, which I'll refer to as P0, uh, which generates a lexicon. Um, in this case, it's going to be a distribution over possible phonemic forms. Um, so I'm going to call that the generator or lexicon generator. Uh, and then in step two, we're going to generate frequencies for those lexical items according to some stochastic process, which I'll refer to as the adapter. Um, so the idea here is that each component of this model can actually be independently modified, which allows us a lot of flexibility. And by choosing uh, different components or different models uh, for each of those components, we can solve different kinds of learning tasks. So today I'm going to be talking about word segmentation and morphology, uh, but um, uh, we've also done some work, actually mostly Mark has uh, worked on this, but uh, developing models for syntax as well, where you kind of have to imagine the word lexicon interpreted very broadly, where in this case the lexicon uh, would consist of actual uh, trees and subtrees um, in a, in a, um, in a uh, tree bank. Um, and so you can actually uh, separately generate those trees and subtrees and then assign frequencies to them at a later point with the adapter. Um, okay, so let me just go through an example of how we might apply this framework to the problem of word segmentation. Um, so here's uh, our first model. It's going to include uh, a couple of basic assumptions. The first assumption is that words tend to be relatively short. Uh, so basically what I'm showing up here is just a, a, a unigram phoneme model. So it says, oops, I don't think this is, oh, there it goes. Um, the probability that a word consists of a particular sequence of phonemes uh, is just the product of the probability of those phonemes, and p hash is just the probability of a word boundary. Okay, so. This is obviously a pretty basic model, but let's just go with it for, the first, for our first pass. Um, and then once we've generated the words, we need to assign frequencies to them, and we do that by assuming that those frequencies follow a power law distribution. Um, and we do this by using what's known as the Chinese restaurant process as the adapter. Um, now, I'm sure some of you have seen the Chinese restaurant process before, um, but for those of you who haven't, I'm going to just go over it pretty quickly here. Um, so the Chinese restaurant process uh, is a stochastic process that groups items, which in this case are going to be words, into clusters, where the number of items in each cluster is going to fo follow a power law distribution. So uh, to imagine how this works, we imagine a restaurant that has an infinite number of tables. Uh, each of those tables has an infinite seating capacity. 
and customers are going to come into the restaurant and sit down at a table. The table that's chosen by the ith customer, which I'm going to refer to as zi, depends on the uh, seating arrangement of the previous i minus customers. Um, and in particular, the probability distribution um, is going to be uh, proportional. So the pr probability that the person sits at the kth table is proportional to the number of people that are already sitting at that table, nk, assuming that that number is greater than 1. Uh, sorry, is greater than 0. Uh, and it's proportional to some constant parameter alpha naught uh, uh, that the person will actually sit at a next unoccupied table. So there's always some probability of uh, adding a new table to this restaurant. OK. Uh, so if we want to think about this in terms of the two-stage process, we can think of this as a two-stage restaurant where first we're going to generate labels for these tables according to our generator distribution P0, and then we're going to seat customers at those tables according to the Chinese restaurant process. So this basically whoops, gives us a distribution over uh, the, uh, sorry, it gives us a, a, a token frequency for each of these uh, types. Um, we could also view this as a sort of a cache model um, or an attractor model where we're generating words uh, in sequence as we go along. Um, so if you imagine that uh, what we've seen so far are these words with these frequencies and this is the word that we've just generated, we need to generate the next word. Um, we come along and we generate that word. Um, that customer comes in, sits at a table. Um, with probability proportional to the number of words at that table. We come in, we keep generating words. At some point, we generate a new table and go back to the generator process to generate a label for that table. Um, one thing that I, that I didn't stress here, but uh, because this uh, generator model is actually a discrete distribution, it's actually possible that two different tables might have the same label on them. So what that means is that in order to figure out the uh, predictive distribution of words, the probability that the ith word takes on a particular value, we need to actually sum over all the tables that have the same label. Um, what we get then is just that uh, this probability is uh, going to be pr uh, equal to the number of times we've seen that word previously plus alpha naught, our parameter, times the generator distribution. Okay. Those of you who are familiar with the Dirichlet process will notice that what I've just described is in fact a Dirichlet process with concentration parameter alpha naught and base distribution p naught. Um, and one other point that I want to make about this is that words in this model are not independent um, because they do depend on the number of times uh, as we go, go along generating words, uh, the probability of a word depends on the number of times we've seen it before. Um, however, words are exchangeable. Um, so the probability of a particular set of words doesn't depend on the ordering. Um, and so I can still get away with calling this a unigram model because basically what that means to me is that the probability of a word doesn't depend on the context, the immediate context in which it occurs. Okay, so I've gone through this example of using the two-stage framework. Um, what are some advantages of, of thinking about uh, modeling in this way? Well, I think, first of all, uh, if we uh, choose our generator and adapter appropriately, um, this framework is going to give us models that favor sparse solutions, um, by which I mean solutions where we have a relatively small number of parameters uh, in comparison to the size of the data that we're looking at. Um, on the other hand, these solutions, the solution size will grow with the size of the data. Um, and in addition, we actually have some additional flexibility. So, for example, um, in this model that I just talked about, uh, depending on the choice of alpha naught, um, we'll actually get slightly different uh, sparseness in our, in our solution. So if we choose a smaller value of alpha naught, then we're going to get fewer novel, uh, fewer people sitting at new tables and fewer novel lexical items. Um, another advantage here is that, as I mentioned before, we can infer different kinds of linguistic structure. So later on, I'm going to be talking about a different generator that we can use for learning morphology. Uh, and finally, um, this, uh, models within this framework are amenable to standard search procedures like Gibbs sampling. Um, I'm not going to be focusing much on that, although I will touch on it very briefly. There's a question here. Yeah. So some of the earlier approach, you talk about mixed molecular approach. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the problem you mentioned there can be corrected by adding regularization you know, or maybe um, the minimum description length. Yeah, so, well, so minimum description length, I mean, that's, that's not a maximum likelihood well, thing, yeah, right? That's a Bayesian, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so the question is, in mathematics, yeah, that ought to be equivalent to Bayesian approach. Yeah, so, so MDL is, in fact, I mean, that, that's a Bayesian approach. Um, 
I guess I would argue that the, that the difference between this and doing MDL is that, um, so MDL is in some sense actually gives you a little bit more flexibility uh, in, in terms of what you can put in your prior. Um, but at the cost of losing the standard search procedures. So generally speaking, when people do MDL, they've designed some special purpose heuristic search procedure um, or maybe some you know, genetic algorithm or some simulated algorithm. kneeling or uh, something. Whatever um, you know, heuristic that you put there somehow can be equated to some heuristic you put over here in the Bayesian level. It, it's related to how you choose the prime, uh, hyper prime. Yes. So hyper essentially, you know, it's equivalent to whatever heuristic you're talking about. In MDL. So I just wonder whether this uh, gives sampling that advantage over here is something that you think is more natural for this framework rather than MDM. Um, well, yeah. So I mean, I, I guess there there are sort of there are trade offs. I mean, I, I'm not going to say that MDL is you know is isn't going to work um, because obviously people have gotten good solutions with MDL, and I think it's a you know it can right. It's definitely an alter, excuse me, alternative approach. Um, I think, uh, as I said, I mean, I, I do think that actually. So so Gib sampling does have and an variational methods, and you know there are, are these standard procedures that have sort of guarantees, and you you know so. I mean, in fact, uh, well, actually, I guess the Brent model that I mentioned is not an MDL one. He had an earlier model that was based on MDL. Um, but uh, I'll talk a little bit later about the fact that, it, it, you know, his model had a very clear optimization function, um, and it seemed like it was doing pretty well in optimizing that function. The problem is, once we actually did this work, we found a better solution that had a better probability under his model. And there's really no way of knowing. I mean, obviously, there also this is a potential problem. Even when you've got you know search procedures that are guaranteed to converge and whatnot, you don't know. I mean, search is always a big problem. I'm not going to claim that it's not, <laughs> but I do think it's advantageous to try to factor that out of the equation as much as possible. I guess that's yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, right. Okay. So just one more point that I want to make about this framework. Um, is about its generality. Um, so I've sort of talked about one specific version, and I'm going to talk about another one with the morphology. But um, I want to—I just want to emphasize that this is kind of a way of viewing the world. It's not like you know we've invented the Dirichlet process here. Um, but this framework kind of d does actually encompass a number of um, well-known model classes. Um, so you can see those as special cases of this framework. So I talked about the Dirichlet process. Um, it turns out. Um, that I, uh, in order to get a Dirichlet process, it actually um, you actually have to have a generator that has a distribution over an infinite number of um, lexical items. Um, if you have a distribution o over only a finite number of lexical items, it turns out that this uh, same model with the uh, with the CRP adapter will actually end up giving you a Dirichlet multinomial model, which is also another standard Bayesian model. Um, and then later in the talk, I'm going to talk about um, this Pitman-Yor process, which you can plug in as a different adapter and end up with um, what has been termed the pittman your language model. Um, I think the more general term for this outside of language um, is the Poisson-Dirichlet process. But I'm, yeah, Mark is nodding, so I think I might have got, must have gotten, gotten that right. Two-parameter <laughs> Two Poisson-Dirichlet process. OK. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, so again, that's something that's, that's out there in the literature. Um, OK, so let's, let me get back to word segmentation. Yes? I guess. Oh, and this is my, my kind of hunch that okay. the way you choose different models so far at this stage actually is mostly motivated by how trackable mathematical framework can work. Yeah, there, there is. Rather than doing some empirical verification to see, well, if you get a lot of data, you can plot the situation to see whether how much they fit into. Maybe it's not. I, I mean, I think there's some of both, right? There's definitely some issues having to do with math mathematical tractability that are kind of limiting some of the ways that we're choosing things. On the other hand, we're not just kind of arbitrarily choosing a model because it's tractable, right? I mean, there are reasons why we want to choose certain things about the model. How, how that kind of parametric model, well, actually, it is a parametric model. You call it a parametric model, but it, it, it does have a few parameters there. OK, if you prefer, you can call it an infinite model. OK, infinite. So yeah. people look at how that kind of model actually can fit the empirical data just as the first trial. You know, yeah, so. so far away from, you know, from yeah. Well, so so maybe may, maybe I should talk some more about my results, and then if you still have that question, you can ask about that. <laughs> okay. Uh, so so word segmentation. Um, so it turns out we actually had a real real research question that we wanted to look at with word segmentation, not just kind of 
you know, develop this model um, for no reason. Um, what we were interested in is looking at whether uh, segmentation can be improved by the use of context. Um, and so the reason that we were looking at this is because there were some previous models developed um, by both Van Katraman as well as Brent um, that were unigram models and actually seemed to work pretty well. Um, and in fact, Van Katraman also developed a bigram and a trigram model that didn't really make much difference to the problem. Um, but as we've seen, actually Van Katraman's models were all constrained by his search procedure. Um, and so we weren't really sure, you know, whether this result was true or not. And so we wanted to look at the difference between uh, no context in the unigram model and some context. Um, so our baseline is going to be this unigram Dirichlet process model, uh, where we have a generator that prefers short words, um, and we're using the CRP to generate frequencies. Um, we also had to add one thing into the model, which is that um, we assume that utterance lengths uh, follow a geometric distribution. Um, and then uh, to do our inference here, we did use a Gibbs sampler. Um, what that does for us is it actually samples from the posterior distribution over hypotheses. In this case, hypotheses are going to be basically just different sequences of words, um, as long as those sequences are, are consistent with the data that we've seen. Um, we then initialize the boundaries in, uh, at random, and then we're going to iterate by comparing pairs of hypotheses that differ by a single word boundary, uh, um, as I'm showing here. Um, we can then calculate the probabilities of the words that differ given the current counts of all other words. Um, the way that we do that is using the predictive distribution that I showed earlier, the probability that the ith word equals a particular value given all the other stuff. Um, this makes use of the exchangeability property. Um, and then we're going to sample one of these two hypotheses according to the uh, ratio of the two probabilities um, that we've just calculated. Um, and uh, assume that that word boundary is correct, move on to the next word boundary and just continue in that fashion. Um, and then once this process converges, our samples are going to be from the posterior distribution. So we ran some experiments um, testing this model uh, using the same corpus that was used by Brent and Van Katerman. Uh, this is a corpus that contains about 10,000 utterances of phonemically transcribed child-directed speech um, aimed at children, pretty young children, um, mostly preverbal. Um, and the utterance length and word length are actually pretty short in this corpus. Uh, we used different values of the parameters and evaluated a single sample after 20,000 iterations. Um, I'm not going to show results for all these different parameter values because basically they all have about the same, uh, well, slightly different, but more or less they all kind of look like this. Um, so what you'll notice, I'm showing, I'm showing the errors here in red. Um, what you'll notice is that this algorithm is proposing uh, boundaries and when it, when it does, they're almost always right. It's just not proposing nearly enough boundaries. So it's kind of glomming together a lot of words. Um, and if we actually look at the numbers, we can see that that's the case. Um, so our DP model is getting really high precision on word boundaries compared to these other two guys. Um, but recall is very low. Um, what that means overall is that our um, precision and recall on word tokens is much lower than previous work. Um, we actually are doing somewhat better on um, lexicon accuracy, so if we don't wait by the frequencies of words, um, what that actually suggests is that it's actually doing worse on frequent words than it is on infrequent words. And I would suggest that the reason for that is that we're just making a false modeling assumption. Um, so this model assumes that words are generated conditioned only on the previous frequencies of those words, um, but in fact we know that that's not the case in natural language. Um, so the only way that this model is able to capture the very strong kinds of word-to-word -word dependencies that occur in this corpus is by actually collocating words, um, particularly frequent words. Yeah, actually the standard yeah. way of overcoming model in inadequacy. I'm sorry? The conventional way of overcoming yeah. the problem you just mentioned, yeah. namely the uh, model isn't accurate. Right. Yeah. It's discriminatory training. Yeah, OK. Well, <laughs> but, or we could fix the model, <laughs> which is what I'll talk about in a second. <laughs> so um, OK. So right, so the model is wrong. We know the model is wrong. Um, we could actually imagine that maybe there's something else that's wrong with the model. Um, like maybe if we improve the generator, I mean the generator is kind of dopey also, right? It's just a unigram phoneme model. Um, so maybe we could fix that and improve our um, accuracy. It turns out if we do that, we improve the type accuracy even more, but it really doesn't have that much effect on the token accuracy. Um, in fact, um, one of my co-authors, Tom Griffiths, has done some mathematical analysis showing that really any reasonable unigram model is going to have similar problems to this. Um, so really, it is this context problem that's, that's the problem. Um, and of course, previous models didn't reveal this uh, because of the search, right? 
So I've already talked about maximum likelihood and why that's not finding word boundaries. It turns out Brent's model, as I mentioned, um, also assigns higher probability to the solution that we found um, with our system than, he, uh, than his model assigns to either the true solution or his own solution. So he's clearly also having search problems. Um, we know that our search procedure in this case is working really nicely because we can actually randomly permute the words in the corpus, um, which means now the corpus corresponds to the unigram assumption that we're making. If we do this, we actually get an F score of 96%. So our search procedure really is working. Um, what that suggests is that you know, we could take home, well, maybe if you have a bad model, all you need to do is implement a bad search algorithm, and maybe you'll get good results. I think that's the wrong take-home message. I think the right take-home message is fix the model. So that's what we're going to do. So we decided we should add some bigram dependencies to the model. And the way that we did that is using a hierarchical Dirichlet process. Um, so the way that this works uh, is first we're going to generate a distribution G that's a distribution over words using a Dirichlet process, um, which is exactly the one that I talked about earlier for the Unigram model. Once we've done that, then for each word in the data, each word type, we're now going to have a distribution over the words that follow that word um, using a Dirichlet process whose base distribution is now G, this unigram distribution I talked about earlier. So you can kind of imagine this as sort of, uh, it's generating bigrams according to a DP uh, when it decides that it wants to generate a new word that it's never seen after this word, uh, then we're going to kind of like back off to this unigram model up here. You have a question? Could you just say that and wiggle your, uh, <laughs> <laughs> your light pointer a bit more? Um, okay. <laughs> there you go. I was okay. The and okay. That. So if we're generating, so right, so we're generating bigrams. Uh, we want to generate words that come after this word. Right. Uh, so we're going to do that according to our Dirichlet process. Th so these are counts of the things that follow the word C. Um, and every time we need to generate a new word that follows this that we've never seen before, uh, we're going to pick that word according to this kind of back off unigram distribution up here. Uh, uh, right? Okay. Here? <laughs> yes. Okay. Is that good? Context word influence how many words are seen in that context, but not what they are. Yes, that is exactly right. So, yeah. So the idea is that words. Uh, yeah. No, I don't. Why doesn't C pick the more more often than it picks? It does. It picks. So so the words that appear on the tables here. Yeah. Um, the distribution over those words is actually the same across all of these bigrams. But the number of, the relative proportion of times that this word follows that word is specific to this word. Mm -hmm. So the way you can think of this actually is, uh, so we have a specific distribution over words that follow C, um, but it backs off, as I said, it backs off to a unigram distribution that's actually the same across all of the other words. So it's only when it picks a new word. It's only when it picks a new word, right. Okay. So it's sharing the lexicon. It's sharing the lexicon, right. Because the main is find the back of schema here. Yeah. And the C is the context word. C dot the yes. context word. Yes, right. This is the context word. The, you, you mentioned that if uh, the, the context word doesn't exist, so you back up to using web model? Uh, if the following word, so we're going to, okay, so actually maybe I should, so, so in terms of, if we're actually, again, if we're trying to generate things in sequence, okay, so we've just seen these words. Sorry, I wish this were a little bit brighter. Why don't you go and point? Okay. <laughs> so we've just seen those words up there. Okay. Right. Um, and we now need to generate the next word that follows the word C. Right, so we come over here and we say, okay, th these numbers of words are the distribution over the words that follow that, uh, or we might want to generate a new word. But let's just say for the moment that we generate a word according to those proportions there. Uh, that's the utterance boundary. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so we've now generated the word the. We come down to the, the there. 
we look at those proportions. We, let's say, again, generate one we've seen before. Okay, now we're going to generate a new word. So we, so we, you know, we saw dog. We've never seen, right, we decide that we're going to generate a word that we've never seen after dog. Okay, in order to do that, we generate a new table where the item on this table is drawn from this distribution. But again, there's also a possibility that we might actually add a new word to that distribution as well. If we do that, then we actually back off to the original lexicon generator, P0. <laughs> ah. This is a high power, high power laser pointer. Oh, excellent. OK. <laughs> now I'll just yeah, go ambidextrous here. OK. So I think. But when you back up, you, you, you may end up choosing a word that you have already seen. Yes. yes. Yeah, right. That's right. It's to, right. So you're sharing those. I think, I think I'm going to move on. Um, but it, it also might be a word you've seen before in that context. Yes. Okay. Yes. Is that how you can have both the same label on two different tables? Um, yes. Right. So there's actually several ways that you could have the same label on different tables in this case. Um, it could be because you know, you generate a quote unquote new word from here, which is drawn from there, which happens to be the same word that you already generated. Yeah. yeah. Or you could actually back off twice and in fact to the to, to P naught and generate it that way. Got it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I ran this thing. Question. Yes. This is slightly different from the original hierarchical direction process by day or is this exactly the same? Um I believe this is the same. Um yeah. Okay. So I ran this hierarchical model, the bigram model, on uh, to do the same segmentation that I tried to do before. And as you can see, things are working much better. Um, and in fact, if we look at the numbers, we see that now in compare so I'm comparing this is the uh, unigram model that I talked about earlier. This is the bigram model that was presented by Venkataraman. This is our own bigram model. Um, I should point out, I don't have comparison unigram models, but this is better than comparison unigram models as well. It's just better across the board than all these other models. So, so precision and recall yeah. like just apply one of the parameters in general, like alpha zero? Yeah, so they, so they do, right, so that's why I said with appropriate choice of alpha naught and alpha one. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is the parameter of the base distribution, deep, or the base DP, and this is the parameter of the other DPs. Um, yeah, so there's some variability with that. Um, you could actually do inference on those parameters. I didn't do that, but it is, anyway, yeah. Can you remind me what's the difference between Van Kamono and HDP? Uh, so Van Katraman, this is basically the maximum likelihood model with the search procedure. So basically these are getting results based on a particular search procedure. Um, but these, this is the only bigram model that I think is out there in the literature on this corpus. So that's why I'm comparing to this model. Um, and this HDP is the model that I just, just talked about. So that's our model. So I, thought, I thought you adjust alpha 0 and alpha 1 so that 92.4 becomes the same so you can compare DP versus HDP to see how much we call <laughs> No, it's a, actually, you know no, it's, 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 no, it's just a coincidence that they happen to have exactly the same precision. I don't, yeah, it's not because I specifically did that. Did you just try varying them and see which one? Yeah, so this is this is with best this is with the best values of alpha How of the alpha that I did. I just tried a bunch of ones and yeah. Is there a steep cliff? Um I don't think there's a steep cliff. Um I actually haven't looked at those numbers in a while, but n my recollection is that it's relatively gradual. I, I think one of these matters more than the other one, but I'm actually I can't remember which one. <laughs> You optimized alpha one and alpha not on different data sets. Um, no, so this this is basically so these are like oracle results essentially. Oracle results yeah. for alpha one and alpha not. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. All right. So I just want to summarize the word segmentation before I move on to morphology. So basically, what I've shown is that um, applying this modeling framework um, to the word segmentation problem um, allowed us to incorporate sensible priors, um, avoiding the trivial solutions that you would get from maximum likelihood. Um, it allows us to examine the effects of modeling assumptions, uh, in particular, you know, looking at context uh, without the limitations from search. So we have, in fact, demonstrated that context really is important for word segmentation, contrary to um, previous results that suggested otherwise. Um, and we've also achieved the best published results on this corpus um, using our bigram model. 
Okay, so I'm going to now move on to morphology. You said you achieved the best results in the purpose, but you yes, cheated. There, what? Yeah, yes, you cheated the best cheating results. <laughs> yes, no, that is a good point. Um, <laughs> um, if you had but, done cross validation, um, so based on, it's hard to say, ba based on work that I've done in a kind of a different domain, and so uh, this may or may not be applicable, I found that doing inference on the hyperparameters, so non-cheating results, uh, lowered the results by, I think, about two or three percentage points. Um, so it's not, I mean, it, do, it does give you lower scores. It's not hugely lower, and I believe that they would still... The other parameter must be used to trade off between the precision and recall. And that Oh, so you want like an ROC curve? Yeah, something like that. You, you have the numbers, yeah, I don't know. I mean, obviously there's a lot of things you could be doing with the parameters. Um, I, I actually was really kind of more interested in showing that in theory, you know, if you fix your model and you have a good search procedure, you're going to get better results. Um, so, <laughs> um, which, as I said, you know, isn't actually that surprising, but based on previous results in this area, <laughs> it's, yeah, how useful to, to know. To what? How hard it is to move um, to I mean, it's certainly possible to move to trigrams. I wouldn't expect that the jump in accuracy to be nearly as much. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to actually move on to morphology now. <laughs> um, all right. So, yeah. So, so I'm going to try and use the same two-stage model for uh, modeling morphology. Uh, and again, remember that one of the... Uh, sort of the point of using this two-stage uh, model is that we can separately mo model properties of types and tokens. So there's actually a pretty good reason to think that this kind of separate modeling could be important for learning the sublexical structure that is involved in morphology. Um, in particular, we're going to be looking for stems and suffixes of words. Um, uh, the, the reason that we have to think that this might be important um, comes actually both from computational systems as well as um, from behavioral studies and in, in linguistics. Um, First of all, if you actually look at a lot of um, morphology induction systems that have been published, um, it turns out that a lot of them use types as, as their input. In other words, they basically just extract a lexicon and then use that to learn from, uh, although they didn't really discuss why or, or kind of try and justify it. Um, however, it suggests that maybe it works better, but as I said, they didn't really talk about whether that was the case. Um, in addition, if you actually look at linguistics, um, the li linguistics literature, you find that it, 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 there seems to be a lot of evidence that, in fact, human morphological generalizations are also... Um, based primarily on, on types. So, on the other hand, uh, it's also the case that the corpus contains useful information uh, that we can't get from just the lexicon. So, for example, syntactic context. Um, there's other um, research also showing that some kind of frequencies, in, uh, some frequency information used in certain ways might be useful. Uh, so there were kind of two questions we were interested in looking at here. One is, um, is morphology actually learn better from types than from tokens? Uh, and secondly, can we learn from the types without just completely throwing out all the token information, as these previous models did? Um, this might be useful, for example, if we're moving on to some later model where we actually want to combine um, learning syntax, for example, where we need that token uh, information. Uh, so here's a really simple model of morphology that we can start off with. Um, we're going to assume that each word consists of a single stem and a possibly empty suffix. So this is a model, um, it's kind of similar to the one proposed by John Goldsmith in 2001. Uh, and the generative process here is that we're going to first choose a morphological class for each word. So you could imagine this is something like a noun or a verb, something like that. Uh, we're then going to choose a stem conditioned on the class and we're going to choose a suffix conditioned on the class. Um, so this, whoops, this is... This is our um, probability distribution over words. So I'm going to call this our generator P mu for morphology, um, which we get by summing over the different possible classes, stems, and suffixes. And this is just an indicator function um, showing that we only sum over the stems and suffixes that actually concatenate to form that word. Um, each of these distributions is a multinomial. Um, now, one problem that could arise with this um, is actually the same problem that occurred potentially with doing maximum likelihood in word segmentation. Um, so we want to make sure we don't learn a trivial segmentation where every word just consists of uh, itself plus an empty suffix. Um, we'd much rather learn something like this. Um, and if we just 
did maximum likelihood, then we would get this. So instead, what we want to do is actually add some Dirichlet priors, um, which favor uh, sparse solutions. In other words, ones with fewer stems and suffixes, like the ones over here. So we did a preliminary experiment with this model, um, where we took an input corpus that contains all the verbs that uh, can be extracted from the Wall Street Journal tree bank, which is about 140,000 tokens and about 8,000 types. Um, we produced a gold standard using um, the part of speech tags in that corpus along with some spelling rules. Um, these are just for regular suffixes. Um, and we then just ran our model with using tokens as input, using types as input, and then comparing those to the gold standard. Um, and it turns out that basically if you use tokens as your input, almost all of the words are still having the empty suffix, despite these Dirichlet priors. So you can put really strong Dirichlet priors saying, no, I really want fewer stems and suffixes. And it just doesn't work very well. Um, so you still only get 5% non-empty suffixes. Um, this is in comparison to 43% for the gold standard. Um, and you actually slightly overestimate this for the type input. Um, the reason for that actually uh, is because of words like this. Um, so the gold standard assumes that this E is part of the stem. The model assumes that the E is part of the suffix. There's obviously good reasons why you might want to, might assume this, and it's because this model doesn't have any notion of spelling rules. Um, so it's actually not completely unreasonable. So this type, you know, learning these things from types actually does seem to work much better than learning them from tokens. What's the reason for that? Um, well, again, it has to do with um, the kinds of things that you're trying to model and what your model looks like. So if you develop a statistical model, it's going to capture whichever regularities are most prominent in the corpus. Um, if you look at what this corpus is, it's a corpus of words. There are some morphological regularities, but they're actually relatively subtle compared to the much larger regularities that occur due to frequency distribution, um, in particular the power law distribution that you find over words. Um, and there's another problem, which is that a lot of the most high frequency words are actually irregular, so they don't have any regular suffixes at all. Um, so basically, we've got a model that's, you know, we're trying to learn one thing, but we're ending up using it to, you know, learn something else. So what that suggests is that if we actually want to discover morphology, we need to account for frequencies in some other way. Um, and of course, that brings me back to our two-stage model and adding an adapter. In this case, the adapter process that we use is called the pittman yor process. Um, this is a generalization of the Chinese restaurant process. Um, and... Uh, uh, and the way it works is essentially, it's actually, so when A equals zero, uh, there's, I should say, there's, sorry, right, so there's two parameters, A and B. Um, the B parameter corresponds to the alpha parameter and the CRP, um, and the A parameter, when A equals zero, this reduces to the CRP. Um, if A is greater than zero, um, what ends up happening is actually we have a slightly higher probability of sitting at a new table, and that, that probability actually increases uh, as this number K of Z, minus one. So this is the number of, the total number of classes, or sorry, the total number of tables that are occupied uh, given the previous seating arrangement. Um, so as that number increases, we're actually going to have a slightly higher probability of sitting at a new table. Um, this process also produces power law distributions. Um, it has a, actually a, uh, those distributions will have an exponent between one and two, whereas in the Chinese restaurant process, it's just always equal to one. It's very similar to noise. Yes, it is, in fact, very similar. In fact, it's almost identical to Nessar and I smoothing. Um, this is a result that I actually uh, don't really have time to talk about today, but it is in our paper um, uh, in NIPS in 2006. Um, it was also sort of co-discovered at the same, well, I shouldn't say co-discovered. It was simultaneously discovered by UIT also in 2006. Um, but yes, this is basically Nessar and I smoothing. What you just said, still not clear why CRP won't work in this case, right? Because when you split mm -hmm. in the one token into, you know, into yeah. the I mean, the CRP allows you to do that. Yeah, so in fact, why, why yeah, so in fact, based on the results that we get, um, I would think that the CRP would work. However, what we, the reason that we wanted to use the pitman manure process is because it has this extra parameter, A, um, which, as I'll show in a second, basically allows us to kind of interpolate between types and tokens um, and see whether there's somewhere in between there that works. Like, we didn't know, the CRP wouldn't actually allow us to learn exactly from types because there are always a little bit, you know, because of the fact that you can have two things on different tables. Um, but, 
yeah, in the end, I think it probably would. Um, okay, so this is the predictive distribution under the Pitman-Yor process, um, where the probability uh, that a particular word takes on this value now depends not only on the previous uh, words, but also the previous seating arrangement. Um, and basically, this is the part of this that we get from uh, sitting this word at a new table. Um, so this is the adapter part, and then we have to generate the type for that table. Uh, or we also then can sum over all of the previous tables um, for which the label on that table is equal to this word um, and get this part of the distribution. Um, okay, so how does this relate to the types and tokens thing? Um, so we're going to be estimating the parameters mu of our generator distribution. Um, and depending on the values that we choose for the pitman your parameters, A and B, we're going to get different estimates for mu. Um, in particular, when A equals 1, uh, every word is going to be assigned to its own table. Basically, because as soon as we've se seated someone at a table, uh, this is going to be 1, and we're going to subtract off 1. So the probability of ever set setting another token at this table is going to be 0. Um, so since uh, every token is at its own table, that means that the generator actually is responsible for generating all of the words in the corpus, which means we're going to end up estimating mu from the tokens. Um, on the other hand, if we uh, set b equals 0 and let a go to 0, um, then that means that this probability is going to approach 0. Um, which means that data is going to be explained using as few tables as possible. Now, since we actually have to assign uh, all the different types to different t tables, we're basically get, that's exactly what we're going to get, and then every subsequent uh, word of the same type will be assigned to that table that's already been generated. Um, therefore, our mu is going to be estimated from types. And of course, if we have you know a b something in between zero and one, then we're going to get some kind of damped frequencies. Uh, so we ran some experiments on the this verb corpus from WSJ. Uh, using a Gibbs sampler that actually alternates between sampling uh, variables in the generator and variables in the adapter. So we're first going to assign um, words to tables and fix that assignment, and then resample the morphological analysis, the classes, stems, and suffixes that are on those tables. Then we're going to fix the morphological analysis at each table and resample the table assignments. And we just go back and forth between that. Um, we evaluate a single sample after a thousand iterations. And in this case, we set b equal to 0, and we experimented with different values of a to see what effect that would have. Um, and these are the results that we got. Um, so basically, when a equals 0, this is equivalent to our simple model with no adapter and learning from uh, types. When a equals 1, this is equivalent, we're just learning from tokens. So not surprisingly, we do much worse, because I've already shown that. Um, one thing that's actually kind of interesting is that the results are actually pretty stable over a wide range of A. So it looks like really all we need to do is kind of damp down the frequencies a little bit, um, and we're already doing pretty well. Um, so this is something I don't exactly know if there's some, you know, practical or theoretical result that, you know, could be improved by knowing this, but it's something that nobody had, I don't, I don't know. In any case, it's, it, it's kind of an interesting result, and I think, you know, we'll see if it actually comes, you know, if there's something useful that comes out of that. Um, in, in the future. So, uh, yeah. Uh, this will show that uh, frequency is, is, is not variable? I'm sorry? I mean, does this result show that we can learn the, 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 the word cementation by uh, uh, morphology using mm -hmm. types only? Yeah, so it, so it says basically that you, that Right, that you're learning better when you're learning uh, just based on types. Um, although you could have some free, oh, I should have mentioned, this, this is confusing. So th when I say types up here, what I mean is this is actually, this is accuracy on types and this is accuracy on tokens, right? right? This is learning from types and learning from tokens. <laughs> so there's two different meanings of types and tokens here. Sorry about that. Um. <laughs> okay, basically frequency by uh, users. What? Frequency information is not useful here. Right, it's not useful in this particular model. Um, I would, I actually, but but as I said, I think we don't want to just completely throw it out, right? We want to have a model that 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 includes that information, so that if we're doing something else, which in fact I'm kind of planning to start working on shortly, um, which is uh, combining this morphology model with a, with a model that actually does some syntax. So, for example, part of speech clustering, right? 
then we need to have that token, that part of the model that actually models tokens so that we can know something about context. Yeah, um, but, but yeah. Capability of capture both information, right. this kind of information, but in this particular case, yes. frequency information is useless. Right? Yes, in this particular case, the frequency information seems to be not very useful. Are you going to give us some example that frequency information is useful? Uh, not for learning morphology. I mean, I, you know, I think it was obviously we had to use it for doing word segmentation, for example, um, because in that case, like, we don't know where the word boundaries are, so we can't, you know, we can't do anything with types because we don't know what the types are. Um, you could also imagine that if you tried to, for example, combine this morphology model with a word segmentation model, uh, you wouldn't be able to learn from types because, again, you wouldn't know what the types were a priori because all you get is this unsegmented corpus. So you kind of have to have a model that has both of those. Okay. Um, so I'm actually almost done here, um, but uh, I just wanted to also give some uh, results that I got on child-directed speech. So this is instead of just using verbs, I actually use all parts of speech. Um, I don't have numbers for this because there isn't a gold standard available, but basically I just wanted to show that it does in fact kind of split things into classes, um, although sometimes the classes are kind of repetitive. So these are, again, um, phonemic endings. Um, so, you know, it's got some noun classes and it's got some verb classes. This is something that's just an error, I think. Um, but it's got, you know, uh, various different verbal kinds of endings. Um, one error, kind of error that you'll notice, oh, is that um, sometimes it has, you know, two different phonemic endings in the same class because it doesn't know anything about um, phonology. Um, and then there's also an empty class where, you know, things that don't seem to, ha that are irregular or whatever. Um, but overall, it actually seems to be doing reasonably well. Okay, so some remaining issues with this morphology model. Um, I don't want to suggest that this is a state-of-the-art model. It's not. Um, this was actually more of sort of a, a theoretical uh, exploration in terms of like how we could develop a model that has both the type and token information. Yeah, so that work is based on MDL, huh? when Linguistica, Linguistica, you mean? Uh, or so who's, can, which can, work? He came here to give a talk of four or five John Goldsmith ago. did? Yeah, and that was it's MDL. Exactly the same problem with yeah, MDL. So, exactly. So, so your conclusion is MDL approach appears to be better than the one you are using. Well, I mean, it's it's kind of not comparable, and because his model is completely different, his model is much more complicated, right? So we're using a really, really, really simple model of morphology, um, and and in fact, basically, it looks like the difference, at least for these verbs, that that's happening is that when we see a word like alluded, that only so that word appears in the corpus, allude alludes, alluding, they don't appear in the corpus at all. So there's not really much evidence one way or the other. <clears throat> um, as a result, uh, our model basically just says, well, I'm going to go with whichever suffix is most common, which happens to be the null suffix. Um, linguistic actually has a separate, or has an additional piece of the prior, which actually favors shorter stems. Um, so we don't have that in our model. But as a result, you know, the Linguistico gets alluded instead of, uh, sorry, gets this boundary in here. Um, so that suggests that we might actually want to add something to our model, you know, biasing us towards shorter stems, or alternatively, we might want to start using something about context to tell us that this is a context that we would expect past tense, which means that we would expect an ed suffix and not an empty suffix. Um, so, yeah, I mean, clearly in this case, the MDL model is better. I don't think it's necessarily because it's MDL, but because it's a better model. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. So just to summarize what I've told you about morphology, um, I've showed how we, uh, we can use the two-stage framework. Um, and you, doing that, we were able to develop a principled way to actually generalize from types, despite the fact that the input itself are, is in tokens. Um, we did so by using the pittman yor process to model frequencies, um, which allows the morphology model to actually do its job and model morphology. Um, these kinds of experiments actually justify the other computational work that I talked about earlier, uh, including Linguistica, which uh, is based on learning from types. Um, it also suggested that using damp frequencies might be okay as well, and so perhaps if you had something that you could learn from just a little bit of frequency information, that might be useful. Um, uh, and as I've mentioned a couple of times, uh, this kind of framework will also allow us to develop models that we can simultaneously learn from both sources of information, so syntactic clustering plus morphology, for example. Um, just before I conclude, I want to talk about uh, just some other random things that I didn't have time to talk about in detail. Um, I've actually already mentioned this Nessernai thing. 
Um, this Pittman neural language model, in fact, provides a justification for Nessar and I smoothing. Um, we've also done some work, this is actually mostly Mark's work, um, on uh, using these two-stage models for syntax, which allows us to get uh, PCFG structure without making the same kind of independence assumptions that come along with PCFGs. Um, and also recently I've been um, collaborating with some people uh, in the BCS department at MIT doing behavioral experiments, um, actually trying to look at the predictions that are made by the Bayesian model of word segmentation uh, and comparing those to predictions of other um, cognitive models um, uh, with regard to how they are consistent or not with uh, human experiments. Okay, so just to conclude, uh, I've presented today a two-stage uh, framework for developing Bayesian models of language. Um, I think it has a, a couple of nice features. First of all, it's very general. Um, it's a model that actually encompasses um, a lot of other models you might have seen, like the Dirichlet process, Dirichlet multinomial, and so forth. Um, it's a very flexible framework, um, so we can have different components, uh, our, our two different components, and uh, modify them separately to learn different kinds of structure. Um, some people might argue with me about this third point, but I think it's actually uh, practical, uh, certainly more practical than some other kinds of Bayesian methods because of the fact that it works with uh, general purpose inference procedures. Um, and I've talked about two particular applications. Um, so I've shown that working with this has um, led to some theoretical and um, practical advances. In, uh, in terms of theoretical advances, I've shown that uh, we can develop a principled way to convert uh, tokens to types for learning morphology. And uh, I've also, well, again, people have argued with me about this, but um, I, I've shown some uh, state-of-the-art performance on uh, word segmentation on the particular corpus that we were looking at. Okay, thank you. Generous purpose inference, you mean variational style of learning? I'm sorry, what? By generous, uh, by general purpose inference. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You mean so, Gibbs learning. sampling, variational methods, or yeah, you have whatever. Variational methods. I have not myself tried variational methods. In fact, for a, for a long time, I didn't think that there was any point in trying variational methods because I wasn't, I didn't think that they would make anything, like they might make things more efficient, but I didn't think they would improve things. Now, Mark has some results indicating that maybe that isn't true, maybe they actually do get better results, but at this point I haven't tried it myself, so, yeah. Yes? Um, I'm intrigued by the connection between Pittman your processes and, and laser nice smoothing. A few years ago, Joshua Goodman had a paper in which he tied, he made a connection between laser and ice smoothing and L1 regularization, and I can't remember the details, but I wondered if you if you haven't seen that, I'll give you the reference. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I've seen that. Okay. Uh, I don't know. I'll just maybe. Give you the reference. Yeah. And see if you can triangulate. Okay. <laughs> yes. So let's take your at the, at the very beginning. You said this might lead to some insights about how humans work. Yeah. So let's throw caution to the wind and say this is how people. Do. Okay. Okay. Now, the question is, what is with this? So for example, is it hardwired into the human brain that morphology should use Pitman rule? Uh, you see what I'm getting at? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your and not Dirschlite and not Chinese restaurant? Uh, or, <laughs> is it, or does everyone use Pitman your and somehow got a general way of tuning the A's. Um, okay. Is this, is this just two way out to make even any conject what makes more sense or? Yeah, so I think the way that I typically have been thinking about this it, with regard to cognition is um, maybe not quite as specific as that, but in terms of more like, okay, um, are there general kinds of uh, models or constraints on those models that seem to apply across a number of different learning tasks? Um, so things like uh, a preference for sparse solutions, uh, sequence modeling, um, or, or you know, just sort of knowing that, that sequences are important. Um, uh, yeah, I, it, so those are those kinds of things actually I think would be less likely to be specific to language and more likely to be kind of general, mm -hmm. uh, you know, domain general knowledge. 
Right. Um, as far as, you know, do are we born knowing that, you know, the pit manure or, I'm not going to say, right, so it's, again, I, I think these are the sort of descriptive, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I think, right, so the pit manure or any of these models, I think, is much more useful as a kind of a descriptive tool than actually, like, I'm not saying that this is the way that this is, any of these things are implemented, right? Um, uh, because I don't necessarily believe that. Oh, you don't? Uh, I, I don't, I, as I said, I think this is useful as a, as a descriptive technique. Uh, how is it actually implemented? Well, it, I wouldn't be surprised if it's actually implemented in a much more distributed, you know, whatever way that, you know, but... These things can be described in a much more... Yeah, well, exactly. That's why I'm saying, like, that's why I'm saying that this is a descriptive, you know, it's useful it's still to... The same model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's still the same model. Okay. Right. So we're, we're not talking about your discussion. Sorry, I'm used to having this argument with, with cognitive scientists who have a different take I'm on things. <laughs> so I may, be, I may be answering the wrong question here. <laughs> so you have image typing in the brain, right, to answer all these questions. Are there any research going on now in this case? Uh, I'm sorry, for, for brain imaging? Imaging, brain imaging. Um, so I actually don't think that, like yeah, I don't think this actually has much to say uh, about, I mean, because I think brain imaging is much more about implementation. Yeah. And this is, as I just said, not about implementation. This is a computational level look at this problem, right? So it doesn't say, like, you know, even if you have a pit manure process going on in your head, uh, it, this doesn't tell you how, right? It, it, you know, I'm not suggesting that we're doing, I mean, there are people who would suggest that we're doing Gibbs sampling or something like it. Um, I'm not prepared to go that far. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, I, you know, I think it's possible, but, but even as that doesn't, to as opposed to variational methods, which is also possible, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What was it? <laughs> yeah, I, uh, right. <laughs> but if, if, if you read uh, this uh, Michael Jordan's, uh, I think, uh, in, uh, early paper, there's a, uh, in the uh, mid-90s, he actually did some very interesting work uh, where he actually, uh, you know, predict exactly how how the motor control function looks like in a human experiment, and then it concludes. It's right, but I, well, so I don't, uh, right, so I'm not familiar with that particular paper, but I'm assuming that that was a behavioral experiment. Exactly, behavioral experiment. Yeah. Precise prediction. Yeah, exactly. So, so this can predict, right, so, so, so that's, but that's very different from brain imaging. And in fact, as I mentioned, I mean, I've done some, I, you know, I've been working with people doing behavioral experiments and showing that this Bayesian model of word segmentation predicts performance very well in behavioral experiments. So it does have something to do with the way that people are learning. But again, I, it's not about the implementation. So do you want to say what, what, what? you were comparing to, and, and yeah. just very briefly, and what sort of behavioral results? Um, sure. So, uh, so, okay, so these are the kind of word segmentation experiments. Um, they're kind of, they're based on the Jenny Safran's experiments. Um, so the basic idea here is you have a very small lexicon uh, of words. Um, in this case, let's just assume that they're all three-syllable words um, made of nonsense syllables. <coughs> um, and you create a stimulus that consists of a bunch of those words just strung together in random order. You, uh, make a, you have a speech synthesizer produce that string, um, present it auditorily to subjects, so there's no pauses, there's no prosodic information or whatever because it's all synthesized. Um, and it turns out if you expose people or I human uh, adults or infants or whatever to this for a few minutes and then ask them to compare two sequences of syllables that were both in that uh, string where one of the sequences was one of the words from the lexicon and one of them was not. So the, basically the only cue to whether it's a word or not is the particular statistics of the sequence. Um, people can actually tell you with greater than you know, chance probability which of them was a word and which one's not. Um, so what we were looking at is, um, so there's a few models that people have proposed to kind of explain how this works. Um, No, it's actually, this is just a, it's a, yeah, it's just a correctness, yeah. Um, so people have proposed, uh, usually the most common thing that people say is it has something to do with what they call transitional probabilities, which really just means the conditional probability of a particular syllable occurring after a previous syllable. Um, what we wanted to do is actually compare the predictions of our Bayesian model to models like that. The way that we did that <coughs> 
um, was actually to uh, present subjects with different length utterances. So um, one subject would get a bunch of these stimuli where all of the stimuli were just a single word. And then one subject would get ones uh, where all of the things were two words long, and it went up to 24 words. Um, and of course, the people who get the 24 word utterances find the task more challenging, not surprisingly. Um, but it turns out that if you actually correlate the, the curve that you get in, in terms of difficulty, um, it's like something like a 96% correlation with this Bayesian model as compared to the best other model that we tried, which is I think a 92 or 90% or something like that. Um, so basically, you know, the result of that is just to suggest that this Bayesian model may actually be capturing something about what people are doing. And I think what it's capturing um, is the fact that people may actually be building a lexicon. So this transitional probability model doesn't say anything about lexical items. It's talking about boundaries by themselves. Um, and the fact that you have to be building a lexicon and that you're comparing different hypotheses as utterances get longer, uh, the hypothesis space gets bigger. Um, and so there's just more competition and that makes it harder. And anyway, so that's kind of the story on that. Uh, yes, um, we have a COGSI paper um, uh, that's, well, it's coming out in, we're go I mean, COGSI is in August, so, but we, there is a version of the paper. It's a six-page paper. Uh, it is on my website. We're doing some, that one only has one experiment, the one that I just mentioned. We're currently still working on two other experiments, which aren't done yet. But when they are, we'll have a journal paper, hopefully. <laughs> In Ghostly, uh, morphology model, there's yeah. a phonology component there. Which yeah, in the, in the newer version of it, yes. Uh, yeah, I remember, uh, yeah, so his, I mean, his model is very, you know, he's got a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, he's been working on it for years, and so, yeah. I mean, uh, this so model is really, really basic. Model, you probably won't be able to apply this uh, process. Uh, right, the, the yeah, process no, exactly. Because he's got, not only he's got this really complicated model, but he's got this really complicated search procedure to go along with it. Also, there yeah. may be another advantage of MDP approach because MDP approach can apply. Wait, what's MDP? Yeah, sorry. No. Yeah, <laughs> that actually can be combined with whatever complicated model you know, in my head. That's an advantage? Well, it is an advantage. <laughs> <laughs> All right, if you get a complex model there, then uh, if, uh, if M uh, MDL actually can be used to constrain the model, whereas this approach probably won't work because you when you actually put this, uh, this complicated prior there, you may not be able to have any solution there. Well, MDL is a complicated prior. Or, I mean, depending on how you do it. But it's, it's a yeah. well, Do I get the feeling that you are to MDL the way I am? <laughs> 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 All right. I, yeah, so actually, did, 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 did you have a? So, uh, two quick questions. One, um, for the work segmentation, do we have any idea how children perform in terms of precision recall for your data set? The um, second question is, uh, okay. do you think it makes sense to measure the learning rate of your... The learning rate? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Because as children, I assume children will gradually get better and better as they get more and more data. Right. Do our machine learning methods do the same? Right. Um, so, uh, the yeah, I don't know anything about how kids do on this particular data set. Um, I mean, obviously, it would depend on whether you mean at the age that this particular thing was you know, taken, or if I took a kid into a room and, like, played the entire data set to them, like, how would they do after that? Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, you wouldn't be able to do that experiment because you couldn't sit the kid in the room and play the data for them because they would, like, go crazy. Um, it's pretty long. Uh, but I think that the, the question about sort of looking at learning rates... Um, that's actually kind of what we're trying to get at with the behavioral experiments. So the second one that we haven't done yet, or that we're in the process of doing, is actually um, seeing how the performance of people changes depending on how long you expose them to the stimulus, um, and also doing the same thing with the model. So we actually are looking at that. Um, I haven't done it with the corpus data. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting, interesting thing to look at. Yeah, this is sort of a pet question of mine, but have you have you ever tried any other languages than English? Because I mean, one thing that I, I, I find a little bit troublesome is if yeah. you, you know if you if you train a morphological learner for yeah. a language that's as far as morphology is concerned, yeah, concern, no, this it's isn't going to work. The, next to next to none. Yeah. Uh, uh, end of the spectrum, you know that that and, and drawing conclusions, you know, about yeah, yeah. recognition is, is kind of I, I think it's a bit far fetched. Yeah. 
because there's you know there's there's a lot more morphological complexity in most of the yes. world's languages. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And, so uh, right. Um, so I no, I think that's true. I think we do need to really test this more on other languages as well. I mean, unfortunately, also the behavioral experiments have mostly been done with English-speaking people as well, um, showing this type-based thing. So um, I wouldn't really expect that type, you know, that to change. You know, if you like looked at people in some other language, I would kind of expect the at least the behavioral experiments to show similar results. Um, yeah. But yeah, so that's true. So so Mark, uh, yeah. So we did we did have a well, it wasn't this model though, but we we did do a different model that was segmenting Sasutu, um, uh, using a well, it was a PC, PCFG, but it was really a finite state grammar. <laughs> um, no, I mean I've, I've run the pit manure adapter. Oh, you've run the pit manure one. Okay. Yeah. So that is that. Basically okay. That's that okay. But you must have. Were you just finding one stem and suffix, or did you extend it to oh, find more? So I wrote, a, I wrote a grammar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's what I'm saying. The the that, right, that the adapter grammar. That, that actually knew how many. So I told it the maximum number of uh, right of, of suffixes to find. Right. Versus. Yeah. So it wasn't this model. It was a more. It was a model that actually allowed multiple suffixes. That's right. But it did work pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. Running it on English data, but not on this corpus, but on that much larger yeah. newspaper or whatever more diverse corpus. Because I would assume that this data is a lot of repetition, and vocabulary size is relatively small. Are you talking about the morphology or the segmentation? Oh, the segmentation. Yeah. Just like in you know, Japanese and Chinese segmentation right. problem, the problems are not learning these problems, learning of the vocabulary words of the words that appear very infrequently. Right. There are many of them, right? So right. So as you grow to that kind of more mature corpus, then the problems are going to be totally different that you can solve by right. grounds. But um, yeah, the pro I'm not sure that the problems will be different. I think they that at least qualitative. I think qualitatively the problems will be similar, although they may be different quantitatively. Um, but I think actually, as the corpus grows in size, modeling context in fact becomes even more important because. You know, any kind of dependency between two items, beca it becomes more and more obvious as you have more data that that dependency is there. Um, so, yeah. So I think that this result would extend to larger corpora and, in fact, be even more. I haven't. No. <laughs> in, in general, what's the complexity of the, the process? I mean, the search algorithm. Or um, in comparison with, I say, EM algorithm, is this more, more complex? Well, do you mean complex, or do you mean how long does it actually running take? Running time memory. Uh, so memory-wise, it's actually less intense. Well, it can be less intensive because you actually don't. T I mean, it depends on, to some extent, but um, uh, on like what your model looks like, but. You, nor, often with uh, EM, you actually have to re, you have to keep track of all of the parameters explicitly. Um, depending on the model, that could actually be a very large number. So, for example, if you're doing word alignment for MT, right, you could have to have like a you know a table that's you know uh, number of words in your data by number of words in your data, and you know all of those parameters. Whereas if you're doing Gibbs sampling, you actually don't ever track the parameters explicitly, which means that uh, Potentially, you could have a, a big memory savings. Um, on the other hand, uh, again, this kind of depends on the model and so forth. You may end up with uh, having to do uh, more uh, more iterations. Uh, it's harder to parallelize. Um, so there's other kinds of issues that come up. Um, I think Mark actually found in, in your paper, it seemed like the the total running time for the two things was actually about the same, although the Gibbs sampler that he was using, each iteration was much faster, but it took longer to converge. So it ended up that running EM and running Gibbs were actually about the same amount of time. So I think, but I think the kind of the bottom line is it sort of depends on what your model looks like. Generally, if we scale to a circuit with a corpus, mm -hmm. uh, do you see any problem? I mean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's it is it's not as scalable as one might like. <laughs> I, yeah. Yeah. I think we should
Thank you, Sharon. Okay.